Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, you know, I've asked to chair many sessions. It, it comes with it comes with the territory of being a dean, and you normally try to find a way not to, because every day there's something else. Um, there was very little question concerning this for two good reasons. One, because I have a let's say a personal affiliation with the European Centre, um, which is closer to me than many other things in the faculty, and secondly, because it's a topic of great interest to me. You know, I, I often have to chair or moderate sessions about conferences, which departments happen to be in my faculty, so I have to go off and learn what exactly the conference is about. But here, actually, it's about something, part of which I actually deal with as a professor of geopolitics. And actually, next year, week at the closing of a conference we have, we're also going to be looking at 100 years <coughs> since, the world war, since the war, but within the context of the Middle East. So in a sense, these two sessions will balance each other. And therefore, I'm going to take the liberty of doing something I very rarely do as moderator. So I'm going to say something of my own for two or three minutes before I introduce the speakers. And then there are two points I want to make. One is to say that um, there's a British author by the name of Hunter Davis. Hunter Davis, I got interested in his books because in 1973 he wrote a book called The Glory Game, which is following a year in the life of my favourite soccer club. And it became a great book about sort of a you know, about soccer heroes, and remember I was a bit younger then, and I had other interests in life. And then I used to follow him up on writing all the other, he wrote a fascinating book about walking along Adrian's Wall, and as a scholar of borders, that interested me a great deal. And he also wrote a book, I don't remember the exact title, but he published it in 1997, and basically what he did in that book was he interviewed 20 different people throughout the UK in different places, from different backgrounds, all of whom would have been 100 years old in the year 2000. And he wanted to follow through the 20th century through looking at 20 different personal narratives. Um, I say who would have been because the book was published in 97. By the year, time to the year 2000 came around, I think four of the people in the interview hadn't quite made the century mark and had passed away before then. But of course, it was a very interesting uh, look on society in a particular cultural context. And although each chapter went in a different direction, there were three or four questions he asked every one of his interviewees, um, one of which was, what was the most formative event for you during the 20th century? Now, people of my generation, um, I mean, I was born after the Second World War, but nevertheless, the Second World War was very fresh with our parents and so on, you know, and we learned a lot more about it than the First World War. I would have immediately thought that nearly everyone would have answered the Second World War. As it was, 14 of the 20 answered the First World War, um, and only and three or four answered the Second World War. And for two others, there were I think one was Hiroshima, and one was I can't remember what the 20th answer was. In other words, that said something very significant about the way our <coughs> own personal understandings and perceptions of the world and the history are formed, and at what stage in life they are formed. Because in other words, the events when these people were between the ages of 14 and 18, some of them probably went off to war at the time, in what was of course a great mass still for the First World War, were much, for them, much more formative and significant than for what we see, particularly as Jews maybe, but not just, um, in terms of the Second World War. So that's just a, a point of interest I make as you sort of discourse through this uh, different period from First to Second World War. The other point I want to make is to say that as a student of Borders, I partake in a lot of seminars over the years in which the theme of the fall of the Berlin Wall is a major sort of uh, characteristic. We had lots of seminars and conferences 10 years to the fall of the Berlin Wall. We had lots of seminars and conferences 20 years. And now we're having a whole load around 25 years. We didn't have 5 and 15, but 25 is of course a very significant event. Yet the discourses have changed from 10 years to 20 years to 25 years. Um, because if 25 and 20 years ago we were saying, you know, this was the great globalization, globalization theory, the borders are coming down, the Berlin Wall signifies this, there's a globalization, there's cyberspace, we cross borders, we're moving into something called a borderless world. And many of us basically have built our academic career on countering that narrative and saying, you know, borders may have changed, but we don't live in a borderless world. By the time when we came to 20 years, and certainly 25 years, and we have 9-11 behind us, and 7-7, seven, seven, 
we find that uh, not only don't we live in a borderless world, we may have some sort of forms of borderless worlds in Western Europe and the European Union, but in many other parts of the world, including five minutes down the road from here, but also along the USA-Mexico border, we're building new walls and new uh, fences. Um, and uh, there was a very interesting supplement in the Guardian newspaper about a year ago, which looked at all the walls and fences which have been built between states since the fall of the Berlin Wall, and it was quite a long list. Um, and therefore I'm thinking of your own comment, which you say, well, the 20th century was the century of ideologies, and, um, and that's behind us. And the question I ask is, are these things really behind us? Are we just in sort of a, a, a different wave and turn of events, and they tend to turn and change? You know, we have different <coughs> dangerous ideologies out there today. Um, again, not so far from uh, us here. Uh, we have different ideologies. We have the world being enclosed in other areas. And what I think we have, we live in a world in which there are two parallel forces going on at one and the same time. One is the powerful forces of globalization, which opens up the world, particularly to a Western educated elite who know how to read and who have smartphones, who have computers, and who hook onto the internet. But remember, huge parts of the world don't have those uh, that access and those skills. And at one and the same time, we have a world which has become dangerous again, which is building walls, which is fearful of the outsider. And I wonder to what extent that is so different um, in the bigger picture. You know, as you said, the historians of a hundred years' time, will they say that there was anything really different about today to what there was 60 and 70 and 80 years ago, but simply that the actual groups involved or the countries involved were different ones. Um, so, you know, what, in a sense, do we have to learn from that century of the two great world wars? What will the historians who have 500 years retrospect to look at a few centuries together, what will they say about these differences? Um, I throw these out as comments, and as Michal said, I just ask the questions, these people have to give the answers. Um, I'm very delighted to um, welcome our three speakers, um, each of whom, we have plenty of time, each of whom will have a full 20 minutes to present the case, and then we'll have about 20 minutes left for some questions and discussion with the audience. I'll read a very brief bio of each of the three now, so I don't have to interrupt in the middle. Our first speaker is Professor Andreas Roder. Um, he's a professor of modern history at the Johannes Gutenberg University of Mainz, has been there since 2005, uh, focusing on international history in the 19th and 20th centuries. What I find fascinating is that one of the main fields of interest comes the history of the conservatives in mid-Victorian England, um, um, the German history of the international politics in the interwar period and in the post-war Europe, and he's currently working on a book bearing the working title of A History of the Present Age, which tries to explain the crucial current problems out of a historical and global perspective, which seems to me would relate to some of the questions I may have raised. After that, we have a colleague of mine, Dr. Guy Viner, from the uh, Senior Lecturer in the Department of General History at Ben-Gurion University in Negev, where he teaches modern European history. You may be surprised to know that the expert in Ireland in Israel lives in the desert in Be'er Sheva, and um, this uh, is, uh, and we're glad he's back from a prolonged sabbatical period because it means we're now going to have at least once a year Irish events with maybe uh, with uh, with all that goes with an Irish event in terms of uh, colour and razzmatazz and some good beer as well. Um, he's uh, spent a, a serious period of time at Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, he's just returned from a two-year period as a Marie Curie Fellow at the University of Oxford, and he specialised in the historical study of memory and forgetting. Um, his prize-winning book was Remembering the Year of the French, Irish Social Memory and Folk History. And our third speaker is Eran Sabak, who is both um, a broadcast and a senior editor of Galit Sahal of IDF Radio. Um, he uh, is also a PhD student and a lecturer in philosophy in Ben Gurion University in our own faculty, and therefore he can probably relate to this topic from a different sort of paradigmatic um, angles um, in his comments. So, with no further ado, I welcome Professor Andreas Roda to uh, address us.